Well, let's get started. Uh, there may be more people popping in and we are recording this session because there are folks that couldn't make it tonight that want to be a, a part of the information session. We decided to hold this session partly because there were lots of people, lots of new artistic directors and also artistic directors who have been around a couple years but have never attended a gala festival. And since that is a huge part of what gala does, we wanted to spend a, some extra time tonight just talking about the festival so that you can really be prepared in the next year, year and a half, because things are happening already. Deadlines are coming up and you'll be wanting to think about your programming and what you're going to bring to the festival. And let's just start, oh, here comes Christian. Let's start with some uh, introductions. My name is Jane Ramsire Miller, and I serve as artistic director for Gala Choruses. And I also am the artistic director for One Voice Mixed Chorus, a queer chorus here in Minnesota for three more months. <laughs> and then I'm moving on, which is a big deal. So um, that, that's my, I've been there 27 years. So it, it, it's um, a big move for me. I'm gonna pass to Kathleen. Hello, I'm Kathleen Hansen. I'm out here in San Diego, uh, where I'm the artistic director of the San Diego Women's Chorus. And with Gala Choruses, I'm the artistic 411 advisor. And then Sue, did you want to introduce yourself? Oops. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I was planning to lurk, but hi, I'm Sue Bell. I'm uh... The Gala Office um, Member Services contact. Thanks, Sue. You can absolutely go back to lurking. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jacob, let's uh, have you introduce yourself and just say uh, for, for everybody else here, sort of when you started and um, yeah. My name is Jake Stensberg. I'm with the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus and I started July 1st, so almost about four months ago. Yeah, excellent. And Spencer? Uh, I'm with Cincinnati Men's Chorus in Ohio, and I started about two weeks after Jacob. <laughs> and Spencer, have you, you've been around in the Cincinnati Chorus, right? Have you been to a festival? I've never been to a festival. Okay. All so right. I'm pretty excited. Great. Uh, Braden. Hi, everyone. I'm Braden Ayers. Um, I started also on July 1st with the Portland Gay Men's Chorus. Uh, so yes, also brand new, uh, moved across the country for that. Um, this is my dog, Kimmy, who's anxious because as it's, it's Portland, it's raining. She doesn't like that. So. And Tim. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Tim. I am the artistic director for the Santa Barbara Gay Men's Chorus. I started on October 3rd, so I'm very fresh. <laughs> and uh, yeah. I think you win the prize. Kristen. Hi everybody, I'm Christian Bohm. I am the artistic director for the Sacramento Gay Men's Chorus. I am just uh, entering my second year with Sacramento. Great. And Christian, remind me, have you been to any of the gala events, symposium or any anything like that? Yes, so I was the assistant conductor for the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus from 2000 to 2005. And so uh, I was at the 2004 Montreal was, yeah. Yeah. So, a while ago. It's been a while. Oh, I thought you looked familiar. Okay. Um, Kellyanne. Hi, I'm Kellyanne Grossheim, and I am Kathleen's assistant over here at San Diego Women's Chorus. And I've been with uh, the organization since January. Cool. Alexander. Hi, everyone. My name is Alex. My pronouns are he, they, and I'm the artistic director of Desert Voices in Tucson, Arizona. Oh, cool. And, oh, and I started oh. mid-July. July. We have a lot of July starts here. Okay. And Paul Hines. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm actually old. Uh, my name is Paul, and I use he, him, his pronouns. But I saw that some of the conversation tonight was going to talk about the venues. And I'm just really excited about going to Cincinnati and I've never been. So I'm kind of interloping on your newbie conversation to maybe get some insights on the um, on the venues. But, I but love that. Because, nice Paul, we're going to talk about youth choruses just a little bit, too. So I'd love to have you chime in. And um, okay. how long have you been around in gala choruses? So I uh, started in uh, uh, 
fall of 2014. So this is my ninth season. Great. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. It's really, really great to have you here. Um, we have a little PowerPoint. Oh, joy. Uh, because I think it'll just give you some good images for what's happening. And Kathleen and I are going to kind of whip through that. And then there'll just be, um, you can always interrupt with questions um, if you have Next them. Next week is going to be into November. What's that? Right. Oh, was that Paul? That okay. was just, a, yeah, I, I've muted the. <laughs> okay. So, um, Kathleen and I were just saying we can barely remember how to do the Zoom stuff now that we've been off for a while. <clears throat> okay. So, um, Gail Cora says, uh, we are actually working on a new mission statement, uh, but the, the working statement is currently Gala Courses supports, guides, inspires LGBTQ plus choruses and their allies to leverage, to leverage the liberating power of singing to create harmony and equity for all. And these are just some values that were a part of our last strategic planning process. So I thought I'd put that out there for you. These pictures are all um, photographs from the last festival in Denver. This is a flash mob that we had and I, one of the opening or closing concerts. And we actually have a really tiny gala staff. Uh, I think everybody's part-time except maybe Sue, but Robin is our executive director and I serve as artistic director. We also um, have Paul Cruz, who is our communications director. So he does all the PR and marketing. Sue is our member services director, so she does a lot of the database stuff, will be very involved in festival registrations, those sorts of things. And Dwight is director of development and engagement. Um, I'm going to pass to Kathleen to talk a little bit about the 411 program, which is free for you because you are a GALA member. Yes, so uh, we have a handful of advisors which are available for you, whether you need to bounce ideas around or you're having a specific issue. Um, so I am the artistic advisor. I primarily work with artistic directors, but sometimes we'll bring in a small team like an artistic team, or if the artistic director and maybe a board member need to have kind of a, a middle person to work through some things. Um, so you just sign up or email us directly and say, hey, are you available for a, a meeting? And usually we'll just do a little one-off hour, hour meetings, but um, we are also available to do longer work. So if you have to do like a, a complete board revamp, um, Eve, who is next to my picture there, would be the person who does a lot of work with boards. <clears throat> So we don't want you to hesitate to use that. This program has been developed for your support. Um, and we have a lot of resources from people who've, who've been there. If you've got an issue, it's likely that we've heard it before or something like it and can offer um, some direction for that. Do you have one more slide of advisors or is it just? Yeah, it's just clunky for some reason. Okay, cool. So, have... uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was say, so that was the artistic advisor and the board advisor, and now we have youth advisors. I don't know if you're going to. Yeah, I'll jump in on this one. We have two brand new, they started about the time most of you did, uh, youth advisors. <clears throat> and essentially, we had two candidates for this position who had some really unique skills, and so we divided the position. Ryan LeBoy is our youth and education advisor. So his role is to work directly with our youth choruses. He also is working with curriculum that um, either Gala Choruses as an organization or member choruses have created. Uh, and we are making those available to teachers in public schools. And uh, Ryan will also be working on what we're calling collegiate engagement. And that's ways to just connect with universities and colleges to find ways to offer them resources, but also to make sure that they know, their, their students know, that conducting a gala course is actually a viable uh, position, a job. So um, we're getting that word out. Paul, do you want to add anything about these youth advisors? Because you were part of interviewing. 
Yes, sorry, it just took me a second to get to the mute button. Uh, the Youth Advisor is a great resource for uh, talking through if you have uh, an interest in forming a youth chorus or if you have a youth chorus and want to revamp it. Um, I can speak especially about uh, Ryan because he and I have met recently. He's just a great thinker and someone who is wonderful to bounce ideas off of to um, just get inspiration and also um, new ideas and maybe even uh, some cheerleading for ideas that you're trying out. So I, I highly recommend Ryan. Um, I remember meeting Mitch at the interviews and also thought that he was a terrific resource. So I'm glad that we're able to have them both on board. So Mitch's role is in contrast to Ryan, Mitch's role is to work with our adult choruses. And it's particularly choruses that have school engagement programs. So um, these are choruses, I'll just describe my chorus. We have uh, a couple times a year programs where we go into schools, do some rehearsing or workshops with students, and then the chorus goes in and performs with a choir or with a group for the student body. All kinds of uh, gala courses have different sorts of programs. So Mitch, but there's no connection between them. So Mitch's role is to gather those adult courses together to do information sharing and support. And then also to mentor courses that are interested in starting some kind of school program. Kathleen, take it away. So Gala Courses has a best practices program, and this helps us align ourselves with kind of the things that we already know that we should be doing, or maybe some things that we hadn't been aware of. Um, the San Diego Women's Course went through this program um, kind of early on in the process, and I think it really helped us to look through all of our processes and our um materials to make sure that we had things written in a way that, for example, our board members knew what their jobs were. Um, you can see that there are three um, categories there, human resources, governance, and finance practices. It also um, talks about things like copyright compliance and making sure that um, we have policies for um, ADA, accessibility, diversity, and things like that. So um, there are a handful of courses who've been through this. I would love to see a few more go through it. Um, it certainly opened the eyes of many of our volunteers to things that they didn't really know were things, but it was also helpful, not just like, yeah, you get a gold star, but it really helped things to run more smoothly. And Kathleen, this is sort of like a checklist, right? It's a checklist of um, practices that Gala recommends. And if you don't have some of these resources, then there are advisors and people that can help you put them in place. Is that kind of how it Ab works? Absolutely. So okay. you're going through, oh, cool, we've got that. Oh, we need to rewrite that. I have no idea what I'm doing on that. And I need somebody to walk me through it. And we can help you get through that. So it's very individualized. It's not like you have to go to a class every week or something. <laughs> All right. Um, Gala also has an anniversary program. So if your chorus is coming up on a five or 10 year anniversary, we um, board members and other volunteers within the network create videos to send to your chorus. You can use them on uh, social media pages or you can project them in a concert or just share them with your singers. So be sure to let us know. Sue also tracks those anniversaries, but um, let Sue know if you have one coming up that we might not be aware of. So um, we, this is just from the, this past calendar year, just so you know, we had 20, uh, sorry, seven new member courses in 2022. Three of those were in Latin America, which is just really, really interesting that these courses are forming all over the world. Uh, we had 21 411 advisor consultations. So that's the part that Kathleen was talking about. Um, 10 anniversaries that we celebrated. Uh, we'll be talking about the Resource Center in a little bit, but it looks like we had over 2,000 unique views uh, per month. 
lots of COVID-19 and teacher curriculum uh, resources that are new and over 3,000 unique uh, visits to our website in general. So lots of activity on the GALA website. And I hope that all of you have the chat window open because Sue is popping in links and little oh, extra great. bits of information. Um, the last one was that there are nearly 200 member choruses in GALA courses. Thanks, yeah. So in addition to the programs that are sort of internal for GALA choruses, we also participate in festivals that are external. So Unison Festival is a festival that happens with choirs across Canada. Various Voices is a European choir, no, oh yeah, European choirs. And the Sister Singers Festival uh, is a network of SSAA choirs. I would say for the past five, maybe seven years, Gala has also really worked more intentionally to be visible at ACDA and Chorus America events. So having a booth, uh, speaking at receptions and doing workshops. So these are festivals that um, Gala has been a part of in the past several years. Um, and I'll just highlight the one at the bottom here, the Global Alliance of Queer Choirs, because that's new. That's a group that actually meets monthly with representatives from every continent that are working with queer choirs. And it's just a very fascinating group. We, uh, the next event is a gala chorus performing at the Sydney Out and Loud Festival this February. I have the privilege of conducting that one. So if you have singers that wanna go, um, send them to the gala website to sign up. And um, it's right before World Pride in Sydney. So it'll be a really fun week. Okay, so we've talked about the Gala Resource Center. There are just zillions and zillions of resources here for you. We've already talked about the 411 program, but there's a whole section for artistic directors. So there are ideas and suggestions on programming, on rehearsals, repertoire, commissioning, uh, your favorite topic on copyright and licensing, all sorts of things. So be sure to check that out and just dig in. And then there are sections also for your chorus managers or executive directors and board members. So those are, uh, those are things like marketing, uh, how to work through membership kinds of issues, uh, engagement tours, board development, HR, all those sorts of things. There's a section for your singers and there's a section for youth courses. Although I will say, Paul, I think this one's really outdated. So it's one of the things that Ryan's working on to get the youth chorus pages uh, a little more current. Cool, I'm, I'm happy to help with that as needed. Oh, good, cool. There's a section called Transgender Voices. And um, this has these little green drop downs, lots of videos and resources for working with um, changing voices and particularly uh, transgender singers in your choruses. And another, boy, when you put it all together, it's like, wow, we're doing a lot. <laughs> There's a resource here called New Harmony, Equity, Access, and Belonging. There is a group of um, volunteers within Gala Choruses who have been meeting for probably seven years to create um, ways for our choruses to really talk about um, equity, access, and belonging. And out of that, came this workbook. And it's really uh, a discussion guide to help your choruses think through and talk about, in this case, it's mobility and accessibility, race, ethnic identity, gender identity, sexual orientation, and socioeconomic, socioeconomic status. That same committee is working on a volume two that's almost done, and you can see the topics here. So the idea is this is a free workbook that you can download and do in small groups or um, connect with, um, find ways to connect and have these conversations with your board or with your full chorus. Out of these workbooks, we had choruses say, we need some help, we need some facilitation to uh, have these conversations. So three people on our New Harmony Committee are now available as uh, facilitators. And again, as long as you remember, these resources are all free. So again, on the website, you can sign up and invite or request one of these people to come work with you on a particular topic 
and it might be a topic in that workbook or it um, it might be something uh, that you identify that we could help uh, facilitate a conversation. I want to say about this uh, program in general, the New Harmony program in general, um, that I wish that I had kind of dug into that sooner. I mm. think when I went to the first couple of um, events, they were talking about it a little bit. And I was like, oh, that sounds really interesting. And it sounds important. But one of the things that I didn't really think about is how long of a ongoing process it is. Mm. And it's not like it's something you can do and put a check mark by. Um, and now that we are working with Sam from the facilitator team, um, I feel like we're able to kind of make some more concrete steps moving forward. Um, and it's really nice to have an external voice to come in and help with that because sometimes it is a little bit challenging to en enlist members in like, well, but we're getting together, our doors are open and we sing um, and really realizing there's a lot more work to do in that regard. Great. If you haven't found them, there are all kinds of Google discussion groups. And I really encourage you at, at least to sign up for the artistic directors group and um, Sue or Kathleen, maybe you could put a link to this page in the chat. Um, you can just subscribe right here. And this is, you can sign up to get a, a daily digest of emails that come through or to get every email that, um, that appears. This is a place where artistic directors, artistic directors just post questions. Um, often, I would say most often about repertoire, you're looking for some kind of arrangement or some kind of song to fit a theme, but also just general questions about, like uh, today I posted one about rehearsal tracks and um, all sorts of things. So join is a great way to get to know people and to um, steal ideas from other choruses. <laughs> okay. I'm thinking before we launch into festival, are there um, any questions that you have about gala choruses in general? What? We've it's been all so perfectly thorough? clear. Everybody knows we're good. <laughs> Seriously, okay. those discussion groups, though, if you're not on the AD1, get on it, but also make sure that your people sign up for the others. There's just a lot of oh, really yeah. wonderful conversation that happens. Kathleen, that is so true. I like went right through this. Absolutely. All of these discuss discussion groups are really, really helpful and interesting. There's one for youth choruses here, um, volunteer chorus managers. There's one for executive directors. So <clears throat> sign on. Okay, here we go. Gala Festival. Uh, your next festival is going to be in Minneapolis. It was originally planned for Minneapolis in 2020, but you all know what happened. We tried to move it to 2021, and you still know what happened. <laughs> so eventually it was just canceled, and, and um, we're really excited to bring it back to the Twin Cities. This just gives you uh, a little bit of a sense of where our festivals have gone since 1996 when a festival was held here uh, until uh, this was uh, 2016 was the Denver Festival. But we had uh, over 7,000 singers uh, already registered for 2020. So we're expecting 2024 to be uh, a huge and incredible event. There are four gala choruses in the Twin Cities, uh, Calliope Women's Chorus here on top, and then my chorus, One Voice Mixed Chorus, Twin Cities Gay Men's Chorus, and the Shout Trans Chorus. And we are excited to welcome you. Whenever we create a festival, we always try to design a festival village. So an area in, down, in this case in downtown Minneapolis where the performing halls are fairly close together and are connected uh, in proximity to hotels as well. So I'm gonna start with um, some of the performing venues. Convention Center Auditorium has a beautiful performing space. You'll see some pictures in a minute. <clears throat> and then just across this, whoops, I'm 
my pointer is at the wrong screen. So here's Convention Center. Just across the street is Central Lutheran Church. Uh, and that is a completely different performing uh, option. This particular venue has a beautiful, beautiful organ and uh, cathedral acoustics. So if you're looking for that kind of experience, you'll wanna um, sign up to be at Central Lutheran. And then down the street over here is Orchestra Hall. And that is a, um, uh, an orchestral performance space. Our youth are gonna be at Westminster Presbyterian just across the, um, the street from Orchestra Hall. And then you can see, um, oh, actually this, the Hyatt Ensemble stage is not happening for 2024. The ensembles will be back here at the convention center in a large ballroom. And then workshops, this is the Hilton Hotel. Workshops will be uh, at the Hilton and, um, and then there are hotels all around this space. Oops. All right, this is Orchestra Hall, just uh, slightly over 2000 seats. Um, it has these kind of fun and funky blocks as part of the design. And the, the, the Minnesota Orchestra performs here with the choir behind it. So this is probably our largest stage in terms of just space for singers. We will have a, a small extension on this stage, but this gives you a sense of um, what the hall looks like and what the stage looks like. And there are also, um, we took some videos of each concert hall. We walked from backstage on the stage and out the, uh, to the backstage again, um, including the warm up rooms and that sort of thing. So those videos will become available as you're getting ready to register and select what hall you wanna perform in. This is the Minneapolis Convention Center stage. Um, this is the largest space in terms of audience. So just about 3,500 seats. Um, it's a proscenium stage and um, it, the stage does not hold as many as Orchestra Hall, but um, obviously the audience space is. And actually the acoustics are quite remarkable in this particular stage. What you can't see is back here, there are three kind of domes that really help uh, send the sound forward. And this is Central Lutheran. You can see the magnificent organ pipes there. Um, we will build a stage across here. Every stage will have video capabilities. Um, this is a, a slightly smaller than Orchestra Hall at 1700 seats. And then, as I said, the ensemble stage will be in a, a hotel ballroom. I think actually for, the, for 2024, it'll be slightly larger. I think it'll be closer to 1500 seats. So it's, I think everybody on this call has not been to a festival except Paul. And um, just be prepared for a very, very busy week. It's really exciting and there is a lot happening at the same time. So typically, depending on when you're performing, you will want your chorus to arrive um, at least a day early. You'll get a schedule that says when your tech rehearsal is. It's typically a day before you perform. In the first, again, these are dates from, um, from 2020, but in the first day, there will be some kind of opening concerts and then uh, a series of concert blocks. So we, um, every chorus has a 30 minute concert block and they're back to back, typically in two hour segments. Can I jump in and ask a couple things about that? Because I remember yes. one of my big questions was like, I don't know when to come. I don't know when to leave. Mm -hmm. um, what time is that opening concert generally? That's an excellent question. It's usually um, afternoon. Well, at the last festival, we had one opening concert in sort of late afternoon, and then it repeated in the evening for people who were coming later. Um, that has not been scheduled yet for 2024. But we'd be pretty safe if we came like midday of yes. that opening. Yep. And then the people who are involved in that opening concert will will know enough to get there 
early. They would need to be there the day before because yeah. all the tech rehearsals will happen for the, for the opening concert will happen the day before. And this schedule will be really clear long in advance of when you're ready to make travel arrangements. I'm going to be talking about coffee concerts uh, a little bit later, but these are the orange um, blocks here. One of the things that happened, ah, I, don't, I don't have my, my dates together, but um, maybe two festivals ago was that some choruses were looking to bring larger pieces, like maybe a commission that wouldn't fit in a 30 minute concert block or where they really wanted to bring in more instrumentalists or some kind of staging. And it wasn't possible to do that in these short 30 minute concert blocks. So we have, um, you can apply to have one of these morning coffee concerts and you can see what that means is there is nothing programmed against you. So these are 50 minute uh, concert blocks in the primary concert hall. So there's one um, earlier morning, mid morning, and then in the afternoon, these uh, 30 minute concert blocks begin. Every evening is some kind of special themed concert and we call those blockbuster concerts. And again, we'll talk more about that as we go through these slides. This was the opening that we had planned for 2020. It was called Bring the Sing. Um, 8,000 singers and uh, people from Minneapolis gathering uh, outside of Orchestra Hall for a big sing-along event. Um, Minnesota Public Radio was our partner. So we're sort of figuring out now at this point, um, which of those projects will continue for 2024 or might we do something different? <clears throat> There's usually uh, some kind of welcome concert uh, featuring the choirs from that local um, city. We also have spaces for your ensembles to perform. And typically they have performed on the opening day and then in some late night concerts. We'll again, talk about that a little bit later. There will be all kinds of things for you to do uh, throughout the week. So there'll be food trucks and vendors. We have, we're creating sort of a lounge in the middle of the convention center. So you can meet and greet and um, learn to know delegates that are coming. Um, fireworks, probably not, because we're not on the 4th of July anymore. Okay, concert blocks. Uh, we encourage you to start planning and bring your most unique and compelling programming to festival. It's If you've been to ACDA or Chorus America, this is nothing like that. <laughs> uh, just really, really creative and interesting and um, sometimes very um, uh, shocking and beautiful programming. So uh, bring what you have. 30 minute concert set that includes your entrance time and your exit time. If you wanna bring instrumentalists or move the piano to a different place that comes out of your 30 minute block. So. Um, you know, be thinking in advance about um, what's feasible for you to do in that 30 minute set. And this is only your introduction. We're gonna have lots of other webinars and, and informational sessions about how you might um, think about your programming before you come. We really encourage you to collaborate uh, and share concert sets. So if you're in a city that has uh, multiple choruses, you can request, for example, for your concerts uh, sets to be back to back so that you could do, um, you could share an hour block and do some combined pieces. Or at the last festival, my course um, collaborated with a group in Beijing and it was amazing. We, uh, we did song, a song in English and a song in Mandarin and um, it was an incredible experience. So it doesn't need to be somebody in your backyard. It could be somebody, um, some chorus from way far away. Ensembles, uh, like I said, they will perform on the opening day and also um, in late night concerts. We just contracted with Deke Sharon, who is gonna be a um, clinician for the week. So Deke will come and um, do some coaching for free. I mean, for, <laughs> free for you uh, at festival. These are the coffee concerts that I talked about. They, they are ones that you would need to apply for. And um, 
we'll talk about some deadlines, but the coffee concerts are opening, the applications open already this January and they close in March. So um, we do it way ahead of time to give people time to plan and so that you know pretty far in advance what kind of set that you're gonna have. When we're looking for coffee concert um, applicants, we're really looking for um, something that's quite unique and creative. Um, we're looking to make sure that your chorus can actually pull off what you say you're gonna do. We're looking for diversity and inclusion on the stage and, and particularly programming that connects with the mission of gala choruses. So here's the timeline again, it opens in January, closes in March. Uh, and we'll let people know um, probably actually by April, May at the latest. And then the evening themed concerts, again, these were ones that were planned for 2020. Um, Global Pride was choruses from all over the world that uh, were performing. Um, in the middle of the week, we had planned a choral carnival. So that was um, little pop-up concerts all over the Twin Cities that you can um, rove around and experience. Uh, Beyond the Binary was exploring uh, race and gender. Uh, and then of course, opening and closing concerts. Uh, so your chorus can also perform, um, apply to a perform a song or two as part of a themed concert. So for example, if you have a song that would fit really well for the Beyond the Binary Blockbuster, there'll be a place for you to sign up and say you're interested. And it just gives your chorus a, another chance to uh, have spotlight and perform. There will also be mass choruses. So those are choruses with a uh, clinician and they're for individual singers who attend a uh, festival. So they could be people from your chorus who wanna join a gospel choir or um, some other sort of mass chorus. We had an HIV chorus one year, um, elders chorus, trans chorus. They are also open to people who um, travel to festival without a choir so they can join those. And then there are workshops <laughs> because there's just not enough to do at festival. So workshops on really great topics. And we encourage you now to start talking about festival and bringing your non-singing board members and volunteers. There are lots of things that they can uh, be a part of during this week. Paul, can you talk a little bit about youth choruses and, and their experience at festival? It's a great opportunity for youth to get together with other queer youth around the country. All of our current uh, gala youth choruses get together, and I believe it's the case that any queer youth that would like to participate, if, even if they're not affiliated with the youth chorus, can join in this festival. Is that correct, Jane? Um, I believe like so. That? We did open it up, on, yeah, for, yeah, for 2020, yeah. And there are wonderful workshops and uh, we perform for each other. And, and then um, what, has hap what happened in 2016 was there was one um, big performance where all of the gala youth performed a joint work. So it's a great, a really, I think that our youth found it to be so positive to meet other queer youth from around the country. Uh, there's this sense of not being alone and of getting ideas about what it's like to grow up LGBTQ in other places. Um, super, super valuable. I, I can't recommend it enough. What's the age range for youth or is it just kind of subject to your local group? I, I don't know the answer to that. I think that would be a, a you question <laughs> rather than a me question, <laughs> uh, unless you're asking me about Gen Out. I'm asking anyone who might have the answer. Jane, do you have any thoughts on that? Do we have? We did have an age range. Um, I think it was 14 to 20 or something like that, but um, I don't remember off the top of my head. Generally high school age. Cool, stay tuned. Yeah, stay tuned, exactly, thanks. 
Okay, last time, last festival, we had a live broadcast. And this year, we are uh, working with a company to make this uh, an even larger <laughs> live broadcast. Um, there is a possibility that every uh, concert block will be broadcast. Last time, it was just a few of the blockbusters and, and sort of larger events. So again, stay tuned on this. But um, it's going to be magnificent. I think, oh, Sue, how many viewers were there? 30,000? Is that right? Uh, 14,000. Oh, I, I doubled it. 14,000. Okay, cool. Oh, this is just a list of some of the festival choruses that we've had in the past. Again, mass choruses that anybody can sign up for. These um, rates are from 2020. I actually don't know if they're changing, but they're going to be pretty close, probably. I think, yeah, anyway, um, those the, the actual rates will be on the website mm, probably in the next couple months. And then one of the things that um, Gala will do is uh, offer some spreadsheets and things like this to help you calculate, for example, What's it going to cost for you to pay for your course registration, your ensemble registration, and then maybe to pay for your <clears throat> staff to get there, their flight, that kind of thing, accompanist, instrumentalist, that sort of thing. Um, many choruses are already fundraising now to help send um, their staff, but uh, some raise enough money to send their entire chorus, which I think is incredible, actually. There are scholarships. So we, uh, Gala offers one waived registration for every 20 delegates in your course. And here's the little countdown, just to give you a sense for um, what you should be thinking about. Again, coffee concerts open in January. Uh, in March, the chorus ensemble registration will open, uh, sorry, chorus and ensembles. So, that means um, this is the time when you should just sign up and say, yes, I'm, my course is planning to attend. Uh, and if you're bringing an ensemble, sign up for that too. You'll see that down here, July 1 is the um, deadline for registering. <clears throat> the reality is <laughs> the past several festivals, we have actually sold out, if you will. We, we had more choruses signing up to perform than we were able to fit into the schedule. So if you're planning to go, I would encourage you to sign up right away and make sure that your chorus gets in the queue. Um, then there, um, you'll see May 2023 is when our, this is delegate registration. So again, that's for your individual singers versus registering your choir. And um, there will be early registrations and then the, the price will go up the later or the closer we get to festival. So do you wanna add anything about registration and the, this timeline, that kind of thing? Um, sure, so there are separate registrations for the group uh, that gives you your stage um, time, your performance time. And each individual performer has to register as a delegate. Um, and what that gets you is a pass to every performance throughout the whole week. Perfect. I and what that. I have what I have to add to that is please make sure you have an admin person who's really good tra at tracking details. Yeah. I can see like some eyes glossing over and rolling back <laughs> in head because I totally get that as AD like. You got to have somebody to track all this stuff and make sure that it happens. So, because you don't want to have to worry about all of that, but you do need to know about the music stuff because somebody else will register and they, and you'll be like, oh, are we signing up for Blockbuster? So, you do need to have some good conversation with that person to make sure that they're signing up for what you want them to sign up for. Right. And um, e each course should have what we call a festival liaison, and that's going to be the primary contact for everyone in your chorus to talk to about how do I get registered? Uh, what are the deadlines? What are the early registration discounts? Things like that. Um, how to register, all those good things. So one of the things you can start thinking about is who in your chorus or you know, on your board 
uh, might be a good person to be that liaison. And yeah, not you. <laughs> right. As Kathleen said, um, Sue, can you talk about the January housing uh, opening? Oh, that's so much fun. Um, <laughs> so, you know, everybody wants to be in the same hotel with their buds on the same nights. And uh, in the past, that has broken the housing registrations uh, system, which we use a third party um, it's a gay-owned uh, convention housing uh, outfit, and they're very good, but, you know, we are all only humans, so um, you'll hear lots more about housing, but that tends to be the big circus when everybody's like, when's housing open? And then at the stroke of the bell, everybody rushes on and tries to register at the same time. But we'll have enough rooms, I promise. Yeah, we will. In April, now this is April 2024. Wait, Sue, this seems late. Um, no, I guess that's right. So about three months before you arrive at festival, we're going to ask you for a list of your programming. There's a database that you'll sign into and, and put it all in there. And you will need to upload um, permissions and licenses so that we know that everything you're bringing is licensed. And then you'll upload things like <laughs> a production worksheet, like what you need on stage and um, microphones, those sorts of things. Again, don't worry about that right now. You got some time. We'll, we'll get you more information as we get closer. But save your receipts and your correspondences because like, oh, yeah. you may decide to do something that you bought this year and be like, oh, I'm totally bringing back that back in 2024. You're going to need those receipts or licenses or email confirmations um, so do worry about it a little bit if you're <laughs> between now and then make sure your paperwork is in order. That's good. That's good. And some people have just taken to prove that they have, um, individual music sheets for every singer. Sometimes they just take a picture of, you know, 100 copies of, you yep. know, rainbow bridge or whatever. <laughs> okay. I think we're done. And I noticed that Sue, I think in the chat, um, put a note saying that concert blocks happen simultaneously in three halls. Again, that, that's just so in my head, I forgot to say it, but that is really important to know that um, at any given time, there are typically three things happening at the same time. Yeah. And so, that's in the afternoon. So the yeah. morning yeah. coffee concerts, kind of sit by themselves, although there are workshops and other things going. And then the evening blockbusters um, happen more or less by themselves other than the ensemble performances. Okay, those of you that have been to festival, what do you want to add? And those of you that haven't, what do you want to ask? I have a question, but it's going to be a bit of a Debbie Downer question. Uh, right before this, I'll get the trombone out. Huh? I'll get the trombone out. Uh, so right before this, we had our board meeting, and basically the gist of it is that we are um, riding the line between solvency and not, mm. um, and that we could go to gala right now, but we would use every bit of our reserves. Um, so what? what should we plan for? Should we plan to not do anything? Are there, what are, what are the options for us? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, if, if it were my chorus, I would, I would encourage you to at least um, register your chorus because it's a fairly small amount and then you can be in the queue. You also have options for, um, I mean, not every chorus raises enough money to send all their members. Many just send their artistic directors and, and singers need to come up with their own funds. That's another option. Um, if, if you're really at a place where finances are, um, where the chorus can't send uh, staff or accompanist, then um, individual members can also attend and sort of represent your chorus at festival. And then you don't need to register as a chorus if you're not performing. 
those singers could perform in the mass choirs and um, be a part of other events at festival. Does that help Spencer? Yeah, for sure, thank you. Yeah. I also feel like one of, it's really hard to be excited about something you've never been to, mm. like you hear about it. Um, but I've also found that if there's a way to like hype it more, get people in to talk about it, it's amazing how people are like, oh, I suddenly have the ability to come up with this, this money or, hey, I've got this great idea. Like we do extra cabaret shows when we have travel years. And so we have our main stage show and then we take our cabaret shows and that money goes towards travel. So someone might get excited and then have a new idea of like, oh, wait, here's a way I hadn't thought of. Um, I'm excited enough to work hard enough to make enough money to do this thing, which is now more important than it was before. Good question. You know, and Spencer, you know, you said it's a downer, but um, it's reality, <laughs> right? I mean, a small chorus, a big chorus, a medium-sized chorus, everybody's concerned about funds right now. Um, that's, yeah. Bye, Brayden. Other questions? Tim. Um, I was just curious about like what you just said about like small courses, um, because obviously it seems like in this call, like my course is probably the smallest. So like, do we have a, are we treated more like an ensemble or do we still like have one of these huge, like, uh, like when you were showing the venues, I was like, oh, that's very big for uh, 25 people. <laughs> Yeah, you do. You get to have a big venue uh, okay. <laughs> as part of a block. Yeah. yeah. And if you don't want a big venue, you can also perform on the ensemble stage. But it's um, it's really I mean, for for a lot of singers, they've never had a chance to perform in, in a spectacular hall like that. So um, it's one of the really cool parts of Gala Festival. Yeah. And there's no audience like a gala audience, let yeah. me tell you. Yeah, <laughs> I just unmuted to say is is the absolute most supportive supportive venue. We had you know ensembles of just a handful of people who were up on main stage, and the audience is still like yeah. <laughs> ten minutes standing. Oh yeah, yeah. And Tim, your chorus at twenty five. Um, there are many choruses that are about that size. the The majority of choruses are fifty singers and and fewer. Yep. So um, you know we tend to sort of see the, the big large choruses because they make a big splash in, in terms of social media and, and that sort of thing. They have more money to, to be out front, but um, you are right in there with um, the majority of gala choruses. And when you register the chorus, one of the things um, you'll be asked is your venue preference, mm -hmm. rank them one, two, three. Um, and Jane does an amazing job of balancing um, the choruses in each concert block and satisfying at least your second choice of venue, if not your first. Yeah. Um, it's it's a Herculean task, but it she does a great job. Jacob. Um, I guess my question is, what should we be doing now? Our singers is it happening and i've said yes it is here are the dates and that's as far as we've gone but like what should between now and january 1st what should be like our, on our to-do list yeah that's a really good question um i would suggest you find your liaison and that you and sue we should we should write these things up find a liaison oh, yeah. and start some small fundraising activities. Like my chorus does a one th once a month soup supper before rehearsal. It's really simple. People put money into a jar and you know what? We don't make that much money for scholarships, but it puts this festival in people's heads every month and um, super helpful. Yeah. Gala also has some videos that you can um, share through social media with your chorus. You can show them on rehearsal night. Um, Paul says, start thinking about now about what you want to sing and program. Yeah, absolutely. So generally, you want to be thinking about that program and perform it at some point in the 23-24 season. So it could be in the fall and then you bring it back. 
excuse me, I think a lot of us try to perform it in the spring so it's really fresh and then you you bring it to festival. Kathleen and Paul, what else do you think about that would be good to do now? Lots of time hyping it, you know, talk about it a lot, get people on board um, and figure out if you want to do any collaborations and if you mm. want to do sign up for the extras. I think yeah. first time I went, only time I went, I was like, I don't know how many things to sign up for. And I, I kept getting invitations. Oh, do you want to do this collab? Do you want to do this extra thing? And I said yes to all the things. And it made for a <laughs> very busy, but very exciting week. So yes. you can kind of start to prioritize, yeah. uh, you know, how busy do you want to be versus how much time you like your singers are going to want to go and just watch some concerts too. Yeah. Or walk around the city. It's a great city to for walk about. Mm -hmm. so. you, um, uh, apropos uh, Spencer's question and Jane's answer about budgeting, it might be helpful for your liaison to figure out, you know, a very ballpark amount that it will cost each of your singers to go, assuming that you're not paying, that your chorus is not paying for your each member to go, which I think is the usual case. Yep. So uh, so that folks have a year to start socking away 20 bucks every pay period or something for, for that. Um, because it is doable, but uh, it's not doable if you only give them a month's notice. Right. Yep. Um, we have singers that um, need to pay on an installment plan and we, we created sort of a savings account so they could start right now putting, you know, $10 a month into whatever I know. And I, I know it sounds maybe kind of silly, but singers really like that. And then by the time registration opens, they have this money that, that the chorus has helped them save to go toward a festival. Um, in terms of uh, how to prepare, we're in the process of putting together a toolkit for each chorus. Yeah. Um, it'll have video clips and all the dates and deadlines and, um, lots of things that you can use to hype festival and that the singers will may use on you to hype festival <laughs> depending on who's been there um so yeah um we have lots of good stuff uh coming down the pipes great uh, we're not going anywhere. Kathleen and Sue and I are here. Paul is here to help if you want some other advice. Um, and like I said, this is the beginning. So there will be lots of other spaces. We usually do a kind of a programming webinar, <coughs> excuse me, to help um, artistic directors think about what, what to program, what to bring, um, how you can make sure that your licenses are ready to go. So we will have all of that ready for you. And, um, and the toolkit will have all um, videos and, and other sorts of things that you can share with your chorus, as Sue said. Great. Any other questions? But imagine six or 7,000, you know, gala singers yeah. taking over a, like maybe what, half a square mile in downtown city in a Minneapolis it's great it is really fun because you just walk the streets and pretty much everybody's gay <laughs> <laughs> and, and everybody will be hey how you doing <laughs> yeah. yeah whether you know them or not for every bar is a gay bar thank you Paul yes that's right <laughs> that's right <clears throat> excuse me okay uh once again it's really great to meet uh meet all of you and we'll look forward to seeing you uh, at the next gala event and at festival. Yay, raw!